Good morning and welcome to the Washington Foreign Press Center briefing on overcoming racial disparities in vaccine hesitancy and access. My name is Jen McAndrew and I'm today's moderator. Our briefer today is Dr. Eliseo J. Perez Estable, Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the National Institutes of Health. He will discuss how minority communities are grappling with vaccine misinformation, the value of fact-based health communication, and how federal and local officials are working together to counter disinformation, build public trust, and improve vaccine confidence and access for underserved populations. And now for the ground rules. This briefing is on the record. We will post a transcript later today on our website. Dr. Perez Estable will give an opening statement and then we will open it up for questions. We have only a limited amount of time, but we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible. And with that, over to you, Dr. Perez Estable. Yes, thank you, Jen, and good morning, everyone. It's really my honor and privilege to be here to talk to you today about uh, the work we do every day at the National Institutes of Health. Um, I direct the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and as you know, are familiar with, the National Institutes of Health focuses on research, it's science. Uh, however, in my role as director of the, of the entity that is dealing with health disparities and minority health, uh, I have been involved in a variety of, pro of uh, projects related to the COVID-19 pandemic and health disparities. About a year ago it was when it was noted that um, the, there was a disproportionate burden being observed in African-American communities, subsequently American Indian, as well as Latino Hispanic communities in the US. And over the course of this past uh, 13 months, uh, this pattern has not changed. About 50% of all cases, about 45% of mortality has occurred in Latinos, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and African-American communities. Uh, and Pacific Islanders, even though we represent about a third of the U.S. population. Um, this has been uh, due to the underlying structural inequities that have existed in these communities for decades uh, that have not been attended to uh, significantly over this time. Uh, and this pandemic was just this uh, opportunity to cause havoc in our communities, uh, communities living closer together, two families in one setting, lack of ability to shelter in place, employment that did not allow for the privilege of teleworking like I have been doing primarily for the past year. Um, and this is the main reason that we've seen disproportionate infection and morbidity. Uh, there are more cases, more um, diagnosis of diabetes and heart disease in these communities that have led to uh, an increase um, in mortality, hospitalization and mortality among those who do get sick and then delay coming to the hospital because of underinsurance or lack of insurance in many cases. The mortality um, uh, trends have continued. They're about double. It has been estimated that up to two years of life expectancy may have been lost uh, for Latinos and African-Americans in this past year. So um, as a response, NIH has focused a lot on research, uh, in my area on the social, behavioral, and economic consequences of the pandemic uh, have been a primary emphasis. Um, we, uh, using uh, additional appropriations from Congress, were able to stand up uh, 69 uh, projects to promote testing interventions in these underserved and vulnerable communities, uh, a program we call RADXUP. And then in last summer, uh, as a consequence of the vaccine trials being launched, uh, working with my colleague, Dr. Gary Gibbons at the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, uh, we um, set up a program called COVID uh, Community Engaged Alliance Against COVID-19 Disparities. We call it SEAL for short, C-E-A-L. Uh, and it started as an effort to increase and enhance participation in the trials uh, being sponsored by uh, the U.S. government and Moderna uh, and subsequently other pharmaceutical companies. Um, we, though, set up a, a structure leveraging our community-engaged researchers that we had funded for many years uh, to develop networks within their states um, to promote uh, uh, adequate information, address misinformation, uh, and promote trust in science uh, amongst our communities of color. Um, this uh, has been ongoing now for about eight months. 
Uh, we focus primarily on African American and Latino communities, but have also included other minority communities and American Indians. Uh, we are at 11 states right now and planning to expand this. Of course, in December, uh, we started to deploy uh, the vaccines, beginning first with Pfizer and then the Moderna products. And remarkably, over these four months, the United States has immunized well over 100 million people. Um, this is a, an unprecedented effort on the part of the public health. Um, however, we are seeing inequity in the distribution that I expect will be this decreased substantially as we get more and more people uh, vaccinated. Uh, reports from states that feed into the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provide us some picture of where we are doing with proportional distribution of vaccines by race, ethnicity. Um, and even though some states have gotten a, a really good handle on the pandemic, such as California, for example, Latino or Hispanic populations there have been under immunized compared to the burden of disease that they carry in that state or the proportion of the population. In other states such as Maryland or Alabama, where African-Americans are more important of a minority, they're much closer to the proportion of their burden of disease or the proportion on the population. Um, so our efforts at NIH uh, primarily have focused on this promoting testing uh, through community engaged research um, and also this uh, SEAL effort to promote trust in science because this misinformation campaign has been incredible. And we, we really rely on trusted messengers, which tend to be local experts. Uh, everybody always thinks, well, we get a celebrity to promote this. No, the, the best person to promote this are you're a nurse, uh, a, a physician, uh, a pastor, uh, a trusted community leader, and do locally or, or regionally. And I think that there has been research on this that we know that this is how it works. So I will pause there and um, uh, entertain questions. I'm sure you'll have many. Thank you. Great, thank you. We'll now uh, turn to the Q&A portion of the briefing. If you have not already done so, please take the time now to rename your Zoom profile with your full name and the name of your media outlet. You can virtually raise your hand uh, to ask a question or submit your question in the chat field. Uh, we do have a uh, advanced submitted question from Katerina Soku in Greece. Her question is, do you have an estimate of the cost of vaccine hesitancy to the health and economic opportunities of underserved populations? So thank you for that question. It is an important and complicated one, but let me address two points. First, vaccine hesitancy traditionally um, has not been uh, disproportionately present in minority communities. Uh, with COVID, what we saw from the early uh, surveys in, uh, let's say, May, uh, June, and September was an increasing proportion of African Americans were less likely to accept the vaccine. Fortunately, we, uh, we were able to mobilize um, uh, physicians, uh, African American leaders, as well as uh, science leaders at, in government to address this directly. And the latest poll from the Kaiser Family Foundation showed that over 60% of African-Americans will accept the vaccine. So the hesitancy has decreased significantly. Um, uh, the cost it, it can be measured in excess cases of disease and therefore lost productivity at work, excess hospitalizations, which then would increase the burden on society. And of course, uh, mortality uh, it, it, and, and, the, and, the, and the loss of that represents both emotionally as well as economically. These kind of studies have not been uh, completely done. We are embarking on uh, such a study now globally for health disparities within NIMHD, uh, and we will try and, and parcel out what the cost of COVID has been in our communities. So thank you. Thank you. We have another question that was submitted in the chat field from Bernd Debusman. Uh, I believe he is with Arabian Business in the UAE. I'll read his question. How much of an issue is language in terms of access for the Latino slash Hispanic community? What is being done to address the issue of vaccine misinformation that is out there in Spanish? Thank you again for that question. So about 70% of all Latinos, Hispanics that live in the United States were born in the United States. About 20% uh, actually are predominantly Spanish speaking. 
and up to half of the all Latinos actually speak Spanish at home. So language is an important issue and having uh, quality, accurate translation of all our educational materials uh, that NIH is endorsing or producing is really a high priority for us. There are many uh, Latino investigators across the country, particularly in uh, areas with high proportions of Latino populations, Texas, Florida, California, the Southwest in general, um, where there are expert, uh, expert scientists who know how to do this and do it very well. Uh, it isn't important, as important as, as having it actually in simple language so we don't get bogged down with sophisticated medical terminology in communicating our, our, our messages. Misinformation uh, present in social media uh, is a problem and a challenge across all of society. Um, I, I believe that we, as a scientific community, may have been uh, a bit passive in responding to this initially um, because we need to also promote facts, promote science, uh, not necessarily uh, counter every single um, uh, uh, unusual claim made about either COVID-19 or the vaccine, such as, oh, they're injecting a microchip, oh, I'm gonna be infertile from it, oh, I'm gonna get sick from it. Uh, we do address those directly in, in, our, in our materials and, and unequivocally answer when we have um, uh, clear information that counters this, this type of, uh, of information. Remember that scientists tend to always think, well, we gotta consider all the aspects. And in this case, we need to just be very clear in simple language. Um, and as a former primary care doctor, I know that that's how we need to often uh, to respond to patients' qu uh, questions about particular issues. Thank you. We have a couple hands raised, so we'll go to some live questions. First, I'd like to call on Jürgen Betz from DBA in Germany. Uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, and thank you so much for doing this briefing. So <clears throat> I wrote for media in Germany where vaccines are really scarce and you know people don't know whether they will be able to get it even six months down the road. So mm. for, 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 uh, for us, it's interesting how, how to explain the vaccine hesitancy that we already see in the US and that it must be feared will become an even bigger issue in the weeks and months to come. You mentioned misinformation. Um, and of course, Tuskegee gets mentioned, distrust in government, but mm -hmm. then also why is the hesitancy bigger in racial and ethnic minority groups? I know it's a big question, but just the, the mindset is, how do you explain to my German readers? Why is this happening? Thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Um, uh, the African-American community has had a, um, a conflicting history with science and with government. You mentioned Tuskegee. Uh, there are similar examples, multiple other examples, and the healthcare system has not been uh, the most user-friendly for that community in particular. So that distrust is definitely present. It's a distrust in institutions, is in distrust in systems. Um, However, um, both based on data that has been collected through surveys and my own experience, uh, I do believe that individual clinicians, regardless of their race, ethnicity, can overcome this with open, direct, and uh, frank conversation. I think the reason a lot of people get turned off is they're dismissed, their concerns are not paid attention to, their questions are not answered, they're not listened to. And we really do need to pause, listen, and, and respond in a respectful and direct way uh, and not assume, oh, that's crazy. Why are you bringing this up? Fortunately, the African-American professional community has mobilized uh, on this topic in, in a way that is remarkable. Uh, blackdoctors.org, I have been part of NAACP town halls where we have had tens of thousands of listeners uh, in different contexts. Um, we've had scientists, we've had pastors, we've had advocates and community organizers, uh, as well as uh, regular people come and talk about uh, issues around COVID and issues around the vaccine. And I do believe that the latest data do show that we are moving the needle to, uh, to a higher proportion. So the, the, the acceptance of vaccine, theoretically, of course, uh, by the African-American community has gone from about 40% uh, to over 60%. 
uh, in a matter of a few months. Uh, and so we just need to keep moving in that direction. I would, I would also point out that in other vaccine issues, for example, childhood immunizations, um, minority communities have actually been uh, more accepting even of vaccines than uh, the white community. Um, and for measles, mumps, rubella, you know, the, the, the baby immunizations that we all uh, administer um, are over 90% in all racial ethnic groups uh, as of, uh, of most recent data available. And the vaccine hesitancy or the anti-vaxxer uh, movement pre-COVID uh, was primarily a, a, an issue that took, had most traction within a white middle class community. For reasons I don't understand, I don't pretend, but I'm just observing what the data would show. Um, but you're right that this distrust, historical mistrust in, in systems has surfaced in, in the context of uh, what has happened with COVID. But I think we have tried to address that directly. And I do believe we are make, we meaning not just NIH, but all of the African-American professional community and leaderships are making a difference. And the same has happened with the Latino community and the American Indian community. Um, in, uh, although the hesitancy in, in those communities has been considerably less than what has been reported for the African-American community. Hope that helps. <laughs> okay, uh, just as a reminder, you can submit questions in the chat field or virtually raise your hand. We do have another question from Michael Pearson de Volksgrant in the Netherlands. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. I think you're muted. Uh, we can't hear you, Michael. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Maybe try submitting it in the chat. Okay, we'll give him a minute to, uh, to type up his question. In the meantime, do we have any other questions? I just see Michael's hands raised. Okay. Uh, I, I would add a comment just in general uh, that the equity of distribution of vaccines has been much discussed as well. Um, and uh, I can just share my personal experience in getting vaccinated. Um, I'm, I don't see patients anymore, so I wasn't in the first group of being vaccinated. But I'm over 65, so once the DC uh, vaccinate uh, made itself available, I said, well, let me go on the website and try to get an appointment. Well, it took me about three times, <laughs> and I'm pretty good with doing this technology thing. Uh, I said, well, I can, I can get one nearby. Well, ended up being two miles away, which is fine. And luckily, it was a Saturday. But you can see the issue that these structural barriers were there. Uh, if you're 80 years old and living alone, uh, and maybe don't have a computer, you had no way to get a vaccine. If you, if you call the phone number, I, which I did once, um, uh, because I wasn't sure my appointment was confirmed, the first thing I, was, I heard was there are 300 callers ahead of you, um, and, and, and you have to have the time and, and the patience to wait on the phone. So uh, we're getting over that as supply has improved, and um, uh, we are committed to the notion that by June or beginning of summer, there will be a vaccine available for every adult in the United States who wants one, every person over the age of 16. So do we have the question? Thank you for sharing. We do have another question. I see Michael is probably still typing. We do have another question submitted. This is from Jenny Lonzano from Catalonia Radio in Barcelona. Her question is, how things like what is happening right now with AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe or Johnson & Johnson here how could these things impact in the hesitancy that already exists in the U.S.? And could you please elaborate a bit more on what is the best way to overcome this hesitancy? Right. Um, so I would, um, uh, first of all, the AstraZeneca vaccine um, has not yet been uh, authorized by the FDA here, so we have no experience with it. Uh, I'm closely follow all the reports and the association with this um, uh, immune-mediated um, uh, clotting and, uh, and, and thrombotic and, and hemorrhage, so similar to what we see with other uh, drugs, which is a rare event, but uh, real, apparently appears to be real. Uh, and I think it's one of the things to remember and sobering, you know, that 
that nothing is without side effects, uh, no matter how infrequent, sometimes they can be severe. We saw that early on with the messenger RNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, uh, causing severe uh, allergic reactions, anaphylaxis-like reactions uh, that uh, if unattended would, would lead to death. Uh, so uh, clearly you, you never want a preventive intervention like this to lead to a severe uh, adverse effect or death, but um, it is one of the, one of the realities of, of medicine that, that nothing is without some uh, potential side effect. Um, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is uh, slightly less efficacious in preventing disease, but uh, similarly effective in preventing death. And so as a one dose vaccine, cheaper to produce, uh, easier to uh, store, I think it has a huge role to play in the United States and in, uh, on, a, on the world stage. Um, and I have no reason to say one vaccine over the other, this is better, do go for this one or that. It's the best vaccine possible is the one you can get the soonest poss possible time. And uh, none of us really think this is gonna be a one-time vaccination campaign. Um, COVID is probably going to be with us for, a, for my lifetime anyway. Um, and so we're likely to see boosters or annual vaccination, so sort of similar to what we see with influenza respiratory infections. Um, and then I would challenge this group to tell me what is the vaccine hesitancy in your country? Uh, because I'm not sure that this is a U.S. only phenomena. Um, if we have 30% of the adult population in the U.S., uh, hesitate to be vaccinated against COVID. They don't say categorically not. There's a group that says categorically not, but you know, if you add that to those who say, well, I'm not so sure, um, I think that we can persuade them. And you say, what can we do? Well, the best way is to provide uh, accurate scientific information through trusted messengers. And those trusted messengers may begin with us leaders in government, science leaders in government, but it really has to go all the way down uh, to your local level. Uh, local leaders, uh, community organization leaders, uh, faith-based organization leaders, uh, local clinicians, and not just doctors, but nurses, um, and, and role model. Uh, that's number one. And number two is to remove all structural barriers, make it as easy and as possible. Now, the vaccine is free, so there's no cost to anyone. There's no uh, need to show anything to other than, you know, uh, the normal things we do in healthcare, uh, make sure that's the person that you're, that, that, that says they're getting the vaccine. So some identifier, uh, but no one is checking anything else. Uh, and there are no consequences uh, for getting into some database that someone's going to come after you or anything like that. So I, I do think that the structural issues uh, does take um, a commitment to doing that. I think that uh, our, our government is uh, committed to doing this, but you know these things are not always uh, simple to implement just because you want to do them, and, and we learn as we do it, as we roll it out. So uh, I do think that uh, smaller countries, uh, uh, sort of more homogeneous populations are able to do uh, a great job with this. Um, the challenge in the United States, of course, is you know we're 50 states with all their own jurisdictions and all, own authorities. Uh, but um, and also very heterogeneous uh, country in terms of population. But I think we've done um, a remarkable job to get to where we are now, but it's far from over and we still got to keep pushing uh, the, va the vaccination of as many people as possible. Michael uh, Pearson has submitted his question in the chat uh, from De Volksgrant and I will read it. His question is, do you have a goal for vaccine acceptance among minority communities? If the 40% hesitancy is similar to the 40% hesitancy among white conservatives, what percentage would be needed to get to national herd immunity? Well, there I will, I will answer that by referring to my colleague and uh, expert, Dr. Tony Fauci. Um, but this is well known in public health science. If you, when you get to 80%, either immunized or immune from natural infection, you begin to see the benefits of what um, public health scientists have for a long time called herd immunity. Some people don't like that term as sort of the herd referring to animal herds, uh, but uh, it is a term that uh, has been used traditionally. And, and we have seen uh, in, in people talk about this with respect to other kinds of pandemics. Um, uh, of course, you don't want to necessarily get to immunity by natural infection only, 
because the cost is huge, as we've seen um, how many people have, have died uh, in the planet as a consequence of COVID, uh, almost 600,000 in the United States alone. Um, and if you go back to other ep uh, era, you know, the measles vaccine, you know, the measles epidemic, I was, I'm old enough to have had measles um, as a child. Uh, and the cost of measles, uh, most people did fine. Most kids were not, did not get that sick, but a certain proportion would get very sick and die or develop encephalitis and have lifelong uh, consequences. So we didn't necessarily want to achieve herd immunity to, to measles uh, just by letting every child get infected. We really reached it by a very effective vaccine distributed at that time in the 60s, uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, where we achieved now 95% uh, immunity. And I would say that uh, the majority of the residents I, I, I taught during my the last 25 years at UCSF I had never seen a case of measles <laughs> uh, because it just, they, unless they went certain countries in, uh, they, because it, it had been essentially eradicated from the United States for domestic transmission. So uh, I think the, if we get to 70, 75%, we begin to discuss that we really are achieving our goal um, and, and remembering that the immunity from COVID is not, may not be lifelong like it is from other infections. So we may have to boost uh, in a year or two years. Uh, we'll see the data will, will, will indicate to us when uh, we need to have another vaccine, another dose of the vaccine. Thank you very much for all these helpful insights. On behalf of the U.S. Department of State, I would like to thank Dr. Perez Estable for giving his time today to brief the foreign press today. Uh, and good morning to everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you.